And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John, what went yet out into the wilderness for to see. A reed shaken with the wind? In considering the words of Jesus, if we may not be able to measure their depth or to scale their height, we can with absolute certainty discover their drift, and see in what direction they move, and we shall find that their orbit is an ellipse. Moving around the two centers, sin, and salvation, they describe what is not a geometric figure, but a glorious reality, the kingdom of God. It is not unlikely that the expression was one of the current phrases of the times, a golden casket, holding within it the dream of a restored Hebraism. For we find, without any collusion or rehearsal of parts, the Baptist making use of the identical words in his inaugural address, while it is certain the disciples themselves so misunderstood the thought of their master as to refer his kingdom to that narrow realm of Hebrew sympathies and hopes. Nor did they see their error until, in the light of Pentecostal flames, their own dream disappeared and the new kingdom, opening out like a receding sky, embraced a world within its folds. That Jesus adopted the phrase, liable to misconstruction as it was, and that he used it so repeatedly, making it the center of so many parables and discourses, shows how completely the kingdom of God possessed both his mind and heart. Indeed, so accustomed were his thoughts and words to flow in this direction that even the valley of death, lying darkly between his two lives, could not alter their course, or turn his thoughts out of their familiar channel, and as we find the Christ back of the cross and tomb, amid the resurrection glories, we hear him speaking still of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. It will be observed that Jesus uses the two expressions the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven interchangeably. But in what sense is it the kingdom of heaven? Does it mean that the celestial realm will so far extend its bounds as to embrace our outlying and low-lying world? Not exactly, for the conditions of the two realms are so diverse. The one is the perfected, the visible kingdom, where the throne is set, and the king himself is manifest, its citizens, angels, heavenly intelligences, and saints now freed from the cumbering clay of mortality, and forever safe from the solicitations of evil. This new Jerusalem does not come down to earth, except in the vision of the seer, as it were in a shadow. And yet the two kingdoms are in close correspondence, after all, for what is the kingdom of God in heaven but his eternal rule over the spirits of the redeemed and of the unredeemed? What are the harmonies of heaven but the harmonies of surrendered wills, as, without any hesitation or discord, they strike in with the divine will in absolute precision? To this extent, then, at least, heaven may project itself upon earth, the spirits of men not yet made perfect may be in subjection to the supreme spirit, the separate wills of a redeemed humanity, striking in with the divine will, may swell the heavenly harmonies with their earthly music. And so Jesus speaks of this kingdom as being within you. As if he said, you are looking in the wrong direction. You expect the kingdom of God to be set up around you, with its visible symbols of flags and coins, on which is the image of some new Caesar. You are mistaken. The kingdom, like its king, is unseen, it seeks, not countries, but consciences, its realm is in the heart, in the great interior of the soul. And is not this the reason why it is called, with such emphatic repetition, the kingdom, as if it were, if not the only, at any rate the highest kingdom of God on earth? We speak of a kingdom of nature, and who will know its secrets as he who was both nature's child and nature's lord. And how far-reaching a realm is that? From the motes that swim in the air to the most distant stars, which themselves are but the gateway to the unseen beyond. What forces are here, forces of chemical affinities and repulsions, of gravitation and of life? What successions and transformations can nature show? What infinite varieties of substance, form, and color? What a realm of harmony and peace, with no eruptions of discordant elements. Surely one would think, if God has a kingdom upon earth, this kingdom of nature is it. But no, Jesus does not often refer to that, except as he makes nature speak in his parables, or as he uses the sparrows, the grass, and the lilies as so many lenses through which our weak human vision may see God. 
The kingdom of God on earth is as much higher than the kingdom of nature as spirit is above matter, as love is more and greater than power. We said just now how completely the thought of the kingdom possessed the mind and heart of Jesus. We might go one step farther, and say how completely Jesus identified himself with that kingdom. He puts himself in its pivotal center, with all possible naturalness, and with an ease that assumption cannot feign he gathers up its royalties and draws them around his own person. He speaks of it as my kingdom, and this, not alone in familiar discourse with his disciples, but when face to face with the representative of earth's greatest power. Nor is the personal pronoun some chance word, used in a far off, accommodated sense, it is the crucial word of the sentence, underscored and emphasized by a threefold repetition, it is the word he will not strike out, nor recall, even to save himself from the cross. He never speaks of the kingdom but even his enemies acknowledge the authority that rings in his tones, the authority of conscious power, as well as of perfect knowledge. When his ministry is drawing to a close he says to Peter, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which language may be understood as the official designation of the Apostle Peter to a position of preeminence in the church, as its first leader. But whatever it may mean, it shows that the keys of the kingdom are his, he can bestow them on whom he will. The kingdom of heaven is not a realm in which authority and honors move upwards from below, the blossoming of the people's will, it is an absolute monarchy, an autocracy, and Jesus himself is here king supreme, his will swaying the lesser wills of men, and rearranging their positions, as the angel had foretold, he shall reign over the house of David forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Given him of the Father it is, but the kingdom is his, not either as a metaphor, but really, absolutely, inalienably, nor is there admittance within that kingdom but by him who is the way, as he is the life. We enter into the kingdom, or the kingdom enters into us, as we find, and then crown the king, as we sanctify in our hearts Christ as 1 Peter 3.15. This brings us to the question of citizenship, the conditions and demands of the kingdom, and here we see how far this new dynasty is removed from the kingdoms of this world. They deal with mankind in groups, they look at birth, not character, and their bounds are well defined by rivers, mountains, seas, or by accurately surveyed lines. The kingdom of heaven, on the other hand, dispenses with all space limits, all physical configurations, and regards mankind as one group, a unity, a lapsed but a redeemed world. But while opening its gates and offering its privileges to all alike, irrespective of class or circumstance, it is most eclectic in its requirements, and most rigid in the application of its test, its one test of character. Indeed, the laws of the heavenly kingdom are a complete reversal of the lines of worldly policy. Take, for instance, the two estimates of wealth, and see how different the position it occupies in the two societies. The world makes wealth its summum bonum, or if not exactly in itself the highest good, in commercial values it is equivalent to the highest good, which is position. Gold is all-powerful, the goal of man's vain ambitions, the panacea of earthly ill. Men chase it in hot, feverish haste, trampling upon each other in the mad scramble, and worshipping it in a blind idolatry. But where is wealth in the new kingdom? The world's first becomes the last. It has no purchasing power here, its golden key cannot open the least of these heavenly gates. Jesus sets it back, far back, in his estimate of the good. He speaks of it as if it were an encumbrance, a dead weight, that must be lifted, and that handicaps the heavenly athlete. How hardly, said Jesus, when the rich ruler turned away very sorrowful, shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God, Luke 18 24 and then, by way of illustration, he shows us the picture of the camel passing through the so-called needle's eye of an eastern door. He does not say that such a thing is impossible, for the camel could pass through the needle's eye, but it must first kneel down and be stripped of all its baggage, before it can pass the narrow door, within the larger, but now closed gate. Wealth may have its uses, and noble uses too, 
within the kingdom for it is somewhat remarkable how the faith of the two rich disciples shone out the brightest, when the faith of the rest suffered a temporary eclipse from the passing cross but he who possesses it must be as if he possessed it not. He must not regard it as his own, but as talents given him in trust by his Lord, their image and superscription being that of the invisible king. Again, Jesus sets down vacillation, hesitancy, as a disqualification for citizenship in his kingdom. At the close of his Galilean ministry our evangelist introduces us to a group of embryo disciples. The first of the three says, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Luke 9:57 bold words they were, and doubtless well meant, but it was the language of a passing impulse, rather than of a settled conviction, it was the coruscation of a glowing, ardent temperament. He had not counted the cost. The large word whithersoever might, indeed, easily be spoken, but it held within it a Gethsemane and a Calvary, paths of sorrow, shame, and death he was not prepared to face. And so Jesus neither welcomed nor dismissed him, but opening out one part of his whithersoever, he gave it back to him in the words, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the heaven have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. The second responds to the follow me of Christ with the request that he might be allowed first to go and bury his father.